don't know where to start. We celebrate 50 years, but we're not alone. There's lots of celebrations, and here are some of them. And they are very remarkable. The Stockholm Conference in 1972 set the environmental movement into the world. IIED stands for International Institute for Environment and Development, which was founded alongside and only one earth was the book that Barbara Ward wrote for it. It then moved to London under her direction and, and command, really. She insisted that London be the center for ecological thinking. Um, the Limits to Growth was published in that year. Um, the Meadows at MIT and uh, other people were working on that and wrote it up. And as a result of the Stockholm F Conference, the United Nations Environment Program was founded in Nairobi. Now, I have something to say about all of those things in a moment. And Teddy Goldsmith, and I knew nothing about it at the time, published the Blueprint for Survival. There may be a copy on, on, on the back there, I'm not sure. There, there are some around. Um, and old students of ours have a whole box of them. So the copies still exist. A blueprint in 1972, effectively saying we need to do this, that, and the other and, um, in order to survive. And, of course, the Center for Human Ecology, which is what I'm talking about, which essentially was founded in 1972. Um, actually, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, it really has a slightly older history, but not as a teaching institution. The teaching was founded in 1972, and it's much the same time, College of the Atlantic a few years earlier, but European universities also set up teaching units in human ecology. Um, Huddersfield University had an undergraduate course. But there is something remarkable, uh, other than the last, about all of those. Next slide, please. Um, it's this. None of them used the term human ecology. They all did what we're trying to do, but not under that title. It hasn't and hasn't yet taken root properly. We do not understand what it's all about. And just recently, I was so cross about that that I wrote to the Times Higher Education Supplement an article which they cut a little bit, but then they made into The World Needs Human Ecology a top story for a day or two. I was very flattered, and I don't know whether you saw it. Um, so that was fun. But human ecology, well, we need to question whether we actually need the word. I argue we do, um, but I think we're on a losing battle. I think we, we've tried for all those 50 years, and all those organizations haven't done that. So let's go on with our own history. Um, I looked into the archives in the University of Edinburgh and saw the discussion between um, a committee, I'm not sure which one, the Educational Policy Committee, and Waddington, and, um, and various other people. Um, the Dean of um, Divinity, among others, John McIntyre, we are convinced that there is a prima facie case for the university establishing a center for human ecology. The university saw the point at that time that we needed something. Um, it has difficulties because it's spread over so many um, fields of interest. So it's difficult doing that. Waddington, um, we come to, I think the next slide actually, let's have a look. There he is, uh, typically with a pipe in his mouth. Um, that's Waddington in the Department of Genetics. I don't know who this is. That is Geoffrey Beale, um, an equally uh, distinguished geneticist at the time, um, doing fundamental work in, in genetics. Waddington had a lot of very basic genetic ideas which are also, like human ecology, a little bit neglected. 
Um, he didn't like, minuted in the archives, he didn't like the term human ecology uh, because he said ecology suggests that it's a science and yet it attracts people who are not scientists, indeed who are not able to take on, he was quite blunt and racist, they're not able to take on the scientific attitude that is needed for doing ecology. Um, it's become a bit of a social subject and of course in a, some way it's welcome as we've just, um, just heard. Um, next one please. When he started um, he thought up what is needed in ecology and coined the anagram Kaudang, conventional wisdom of the dominant group. You can't be more radical than that. And I just had a word with Alistair. Um, I don't like the phrase radical human ecology. Human ecology is bad enough, inconvenient. If you make it radical, it becomes impossible. But um, in uh, Waddington tried to get round that. This is a footnote, next slide, um, in this book, which he never lived to see published. But the background to it was on the premises at 15 Buclue Place, and one, when two of our dear colleagues, Living Water, um, cleared up the center because I let it become such a mess, they threw away, I think, the uh, box containing the original um, materials for Tools for Thought, but I do have the draft uh, typewritten copy of it before it was published. Um, Waddington uh, never lived to see it actually published, but a footnote there has um, cow dung in it. And previous to that, he had written The Scientific Attitude, um, both before the war, a very slim volume, and this new edition just after the war in 1948. It really makes the same argument that we need to fundamentally look at the meaning of science, not only ecology, to get at what we're doing. And we're still at that. The lesson here is we haven't done it. And I'm just involved now in organizing for next May a conference on the integrity of science. It's failing us. Fake news, um, fake science, fake facts, you know, all the things that Donald Trump represented um, are taking us down the wrong path. Okay, let's go on. Now, in 1972, when I was doing molecular biology in the Department of Zoology, suddenly this appeared in the university bulletin. I hadn't then read the background I've just described to you. School of the Man-Made Future set up. There had been already a center for human ecology, in a way, but it was only a technical consultancy. It didn't have any thought of teaching. And the head of that was Bill Hale, who had been the vice chancellor of the University of Mauritius, come back to Edinburgh, and Michael Swan, who later became chair of the BBC, chair or director general, I don't know, um, Michael Swan was then professor of zoology, Bill Hale was a zoologist, and um, Waddington actively in the minutes of the archives said, we need a title like the School of the Man-Made Future, and I don't like the idea, as I've just said, of human ecology, as, because it gets corrupted. So they set that up, he turned Bill Hale out. Um, he had an office then in the planning department. The Center for Human Ecology survived. The School of the Man-Made Future started a series of lectures. And his first lecture notes, I think, are the next slide, are here. Um, and he said, this is the easy bit. The easy bit is to describe what humans are doing on the planet. It's boring, but it needs to be done. And every student should have the opportunity to hear what the effects of humans on the planet and vice versa really are. So it discussed pollution, food, population, um, 
urbanization, health, wealth, and so on. But notice this one, controlling the nature of man. Um, that's, well, okay, he used man throughout, and meaning people, meaning the human species. He was not being sexist. But man is the only way we could, in the English language, describe um, humanity. And the nature of man does not really come into these lectures much. The straight, simple part does. The f tools for thought, the previous book that I showed, was in the course of being written in 1972. Um, and he said, that's the hard part. And that's the part that we're now involved with in human ecology. It's not only controlling the nature of man, well, it is in a way. Um, it's man controlling nature, of course, is the trouble. Um, and, and we're still working on that sort of thing. Okay, next one, please. So uh, he started a lecture series uh, in 1972. He himself giving those early lectures with that title set of titles I've just told you. Um, and they were at 5.15 or 5.30 every Tuesday during term time, and that intentionally in the evenings like that, so that it would not clash with any timetable in any faculty, so that the whole of the university could attend. The numbers that actually attended was maximum about 100, but that, that's okay, it went on and on. And he gave all those lectures. And that lecture series, there's one, another one lying on the table out here, later became a, a list. It doesn't have, oh yes, 19, this one's 1993, many years later. Um, it became a list published like this. And we have most of the copies, those that weren't, that we salvaged after the cleanup um, that Living Water did, who threw most of them away. But most of them survived, so we know um, what was done. Uh, next one, I've forgotten where I went. Um, in those, I've left out a bit now, Waddington suddenly died of a heart attack. Um, there was a period where he got a large grant from the Leverhulme Foundation to take all this further. I, it is said he misused it, I, I can't judge that. Um, and in 1974, there was another bulletin article that showed the Center for Human Ecology is really taking off. The lectures had taken off, but it was, as the school of the man-made future, it was expanding. And then he suddenly died of a heart attack in 1975. And there were a series of memorial lectures given by prominent people um, and chaired, the last one of those, chaired by the principal of the university who said this is the last lecture in the series and the School of the Man-Made Future will now be closed. I stood up then and there in the audience and said, no, let's combine the Center for Human Ecology, which was sort of trickling along alongside with only Bill Hale, no teaching, um, and a great program to try and do something about nuclear power, but no, uh, no program within the university. We combined those, and that attracted 100 followers immediately. We had meetings, set it up, and we then took over the premises in 15 Buclue Place known to many people, and two old students, in fact, wrote to the alumni newspaper of the university who said, made out a um, request to, for people to write in when they were students at Edinburgh University, what was their favorite place? And two of them, completely independently, wrote and said, 15 Buclue Place, for this reason. And, uh, there, we had lots of prestigious visitors. This is Alexander King, co-founder of the Club of Rome, which commissioned the Limits to Growth report. His daughter, Jane King, later 
joined the center from Paris and is there still and, and we meet with her regularly. Alexander King um, was very important in describing how you do a radical job like human ecology. And um, he described also how when the Club of Rome was beginning to be formulated, he was at that initial meeting. I think possibly Waddington was as well, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, he described how that meeting landed in chaos, um, trying to think of what is what Aurelio Petri called the problematique of the world. Can we bring that together? It led to the Limits to Growth report, but when they started, it wasn't like that. They led it to chaos, and um, they had a small group, four or five people, who met after the main meeting, and the Club of Rome exists because they pu pulled it together. Here he is giving a talk, and Aubrey Manning, uh, the late, sadly the late, um, chairing uh, the meeting, as one of those lectures that I've described. Okay, now I could go on um, and deal with other things that the center did. I just want to take one or two lessons and I'll probably dash through the slides. The center was re-established by the university. They agreed to continue in the clue place. They provided the premises. They provided a um, intellectual secretary, not just someone who um, listened to dictated letters long before computers, um, but took an active interest in human ecology, who had been Waddington's assistant, Janet Higgs, and, and who, for instance, came up with uh, Frederick Soddy's book, Energy 1905, which says that the age of coal must end. Um, and one of the first things we did after the oil crisis in 73, uh, this is now 1980, um, was set up an energy center. And they published, uh, uh, they created an exhibition, uh, the first energy conservation exhibition anywhere in the UK, I think, the first major one. And they called it Living with Energy. Angus Marland was crucial in um, setting that up. Um, and the booklet I have two copies of, I didn't bring them here. Uh, we've also scanned it, so it is available. And it was sent to every secondary school, public, um, I mean state, secondary school in Britain. And Angus commented, who else in the university has their textbook? in every secondary school in Britain. Um, we still have two copies. Here is Ted Heath being shown around the exhibition by Angus Marland. Okay, go on. And then uh, the next thing, uh, also with Angus, we did a set up an organic farming center. There was a need to be green. And this um, is the principal of the Scottish Agricultural College. Um, we got a grant from the EU of half a million pounds. Uh, the School of Agriculture independently had a grant from Safeways of half a million pounds. Each of those was conditional on being matched by somebody else's um, half a million. So of course, a marriage was arranged. And that, that wasn't a happy marriage. It did work, it set this up. But on the morning of the opening, um, Peter Wilson in that previous picture phoned me up um, about it and I pointed out, he said, are you coming? And I said, yes, of course, I've got to sign the document, otherwise we don't get our money. And he said, oh, no, no, it's, it's only agricultural, it, it's us, not you. And I said, you're wrong. Um, so unless I come there and have a prominent position, um, the thing is off. 
And he phoned back five minutes later saying, you're quite right, we need your signature. Um, so, <laughs> okay. But you know, that shows the atmosphere in the university, despite having made those comments that I gave you, they weren't really accepting that there was another way of looking at things. That made my wife and I, on, when we were on a sabbatical at the French L'Institut d'Ecologie Européenne, we set up in their premises um, a new program, uh, Barriers, European Workshops on Barriers to an Ecological Society. How do we get over the barriers? Here we are with a number of Bulgarians and with Helmut Knötisch, who is, in a way, in Europe, or was, the father of human ecology in Vienna. He was an enormous bore. It was terribly difficult to get anything done at all with him around. But we do have to acknowledge that he did the most of any one individual to promote human ecology throughout Europe. Okay? And the result of that was setting up a workshop um, focusing on barriers. And the, fo uh, the barrier that this particular workshop focused on was meat. And at it, again, Peter Wilson and his colleagues were there. And um, he's not in this picture, which was at home. Um, but some of the other important people are Hans Opshaw from Holland, um, Parto. Uh, Terena Krona from Germany, um, Torsten Malmberg from Sweden, I've forgotten this man's name from Bulgaria, uh, uh, sw another Swede, um, and several other people. And, and it was one of the most successful workshops we've ever held. But the agriculturalists could not accept the fundamental questions. And there we need to learn the lessons, because it's the same. We asked, what would happen in Europe if the meat consumption halved? And the agriculturalists said, you can't ask that question. Um, and if you did ask it, you can't work out an answer. It's impossible. Instead, we are working on how to produce meat more efficiently. So, um, okay, that was that one. Then we held a, a, a meeting with the German and the British um, shadow cabinet of governments. John Smith was there for the Labour, um, and I had the job of inviting a prestigious speaker. And I had met this man, uh, Francisco Sagasti, who had been chief strategic advisor to the World Bank. You can't do better than that. He was in Washington. I'd met him through the Limits to Growth people in Hungary. Um, and I telephoned him. We got on well. I telephoned him from home to his home, saying, could you possibly cross the Atlantic and address the opening of this meeting? And he hesitated, and he said, I've got visitors and so on, um, and I'm busy. And I said, yeah, but you can do this. And he did. Um, and he came, and he stayed at home, and um, we happened to have a big rye loaf, and, and he enjoyed that. And he said, um, my wife offered him half the loaf to take back to his visitors at home. But he was the fundamental who looked at how and where we are going. And then published a paper in Futures called The Twilight of the Baconian Era. Where does our modern science take us? We are based on Francis Bacon's notion, which has become now the taboo subject of reductionism. You know, we all hate reductionist science. Um, he, he did too, um, and he's actually published a paper on it, not, not many people have. Um, the scientific world 
has to change and its ecology and especially human ecology that is actually pushing that change. So that, not only for that reason, but for the, what I've just said, was a good way of bringing forward the notion of a new enlightenment. Uh, on, please. Um, Manfred Max Neef, fundamental human needs. I had met in London and invited, and we became good friends. Okay, two minutes. Um, and here he is with Arthur Bennett, dearly remembered, who looked after the library. Um, uh, and uh, I've forgotten this man's name, but I do remember him, an economist thinker. Um, and a lot of Russian students. We had associations with Russia. Next one, please. Um, the Russians loved my tractor, uh, but just to show there's fun also. Um, okay, go on. Um, then uh, Terry Gower organized at our house a meeting on responsibility, ecological responsibility. We had one on European responsibilities, this one was more, more fundamental, moral responsibilities. Karl Emery, German co-founder of the Greens. Arne Ness, founder of Deep Ecology. Hazel Henderson, the economics of the coming solar age. And Martin Holgate, chief advisor to the government on environmental matters. They all came. And we had a very close discussion, and there is a publication of that meeting on the table at the back there. And I do have it, I think, on disk, and so we, can, we could multiply it up again. On, please. And we had another meeting arranged by Nico, Nicholas Polunin, the third international conference on maintenance of the biosphere. Um, Oh dear, this man is Gennady Golubev, who was the Russian co-president of the United Nations Environmental Programme. By design, being United Nations, and at the height of the Cold War, it had to have a Russian and a US co-chair or president, I don't know the title, but they were co and he was the Russian part. I got to know him very well. He became a very good friend. Uh, you'll, there's other people you'll recognize here. Um, among them, oh, Norman Myers, who came to visit us at CHE. On oh, please, not nearly the last. The president of British Guyana um, came to a meeting that we organized <coughs> for the Commonwealth Human Ecology Conference on they had a big dinner in the College of Physicians on. And then the Russian associations developed and led to Vladimir Kolontai coming, the grandson of the Kolontai who was Lenin's first minister in Sweden. He spoke many languages. Um, here's your friend Alistair who's going to be pleased to be here, I think. And th that is the table. Uh, that we all know in the library here. Um, Colin Ty was a terrific one. Um, one or two things just to finish with. We set up the MSC very much influenced by this man who was shot at his institute. We don't quite know why. Um, made the point that human ecology needs to be taught to the grown-ups, to people in jobs. They leave their jobs for a year or two, study human ecology, come back and ecologize their position. Okay, on. Um, and then every three years I had the struggle to keep the university slightly supporting, only ever slightly, um, the Center for Human Ecology. And they had reports after report, and this is one of them, they said they would not, they would close it on academic grounds now, despite what I've just said and all the things we've done, they would close it, but they couldn't because it would show up that the university was not dealing 
with the key issue of the time, namely the reconciliation of economic development and environmental sustainability. Well, I ask you, who wants economic development and could it ever maintain the biosphere? Economic development means growth. Growth in a planet that is finite is impossible. So I was furious. Economics, development, environmental and sustainability had not been defined, any of them, at the time. That was their criticism. Okay, I think that may be the last, go on. Or is there another? Yes, um, we built the table. Here's Alistair carving the logo. Uh, is there another? Is that the, no, it's not the last one, one more. Um, we must remember our lost friend, uh, late friend, David Reed, who was the oldest student at the time at the center. This is on one of the field courses where, um, which Alistair took us to. It shows how the landlords at the time were breaking up the millstones of local people in the highlands so that they'd have to go to the land so land, um, landlords to grind their corn. Okay, and we sent, gave degrees out under our yew tree with a little plaque of a slice of yew um, just uh, to confirm this is the real life. I still therefore think we need the term human ecology, but I don't myself need to add radical to it. I don't know whether we want to. It is radical enough, and I think I've shown that. Thanks. Thank you for your appreciation, but I think actually it's better to raise some questions and spend the next 20 years trying to answer those questions. So please fire ahead and just create discussion. We're, we're moving into the lunch break now. Um, so maybe one or two quick Ulrich, is, is, is the work you've done on this, is this all the material going to go into the, the, the uh, National Library of Scotland? Is it being suitably archived? Because you've given a fantastic insight to this and it needs to be preserved. to do a thorough archiving, and it is not archived. Um, I have given the, um, all the papers remaining that I had um, that are related to the old part of the center in the University of Edinburgh to the university's archivists. They have those papers. Um, for instance, all the students' theses are there, but the other materials are not. A little bit of it is published. I've tried with Roland to get the whole thing together. Um, there's a whole lot of tapes. Most of the lectures have been taped, but the tapes are the old-fashioned things, and I'm told they degrade if you play them, so I carefully haven't. Um, we'll have them transcribed, but it hasn't been done, and we haven't got the money for it. And I do think it's worth doing for the lessons learned. Why have we not got any further? Why has human ecology not become the science of the human environment? And in fact, in Radical Human Ecology, the book, the chapter I wrote starts that way, that um, we all accept you can study the ecology of elephants. We don't accept you can study the ecology of humans, or more worthwhile studying, even than elephants. 
Yes. So, no, the archiving is what needs to be done. And just to add to that, um, uh, uh, and Ulrich mentioned our colleague Roland, who I think is going to be here today, I'm not sure if he is yet. We did quite a lot of work over the last year on the archive, uh, funded work by the National Archives through the Archive Re Revealed project, um, with an archivist looking through the material, both the collection that Ulrich has and what we have here upstairs in the library, where the, the table you saw is in our office upstairs and, and so on. Um, and the, the feedback we got was actually fairly, fairly brutal. It, said, it didn't say it was of national significance. They had various ratings that they, they assessed things as to whether they would fund it, and they didn't assess. I think they gave us a 10% national significance rating or something like that. So it made it very difficult to procure any funding or to deposit it in a collection. And as Uruk says, it spread around quite widely. There is the Conrad Waddington papers, many boxes um, at the University of Edinburgh Library. Um, much of CC's historical material is, is there. Some of it's in Ulrich's place in East Lothian, some of it's upstairs. Alistair's got some at home. You know, it, it's, it's very dis dispersed and diffuse, but it's certainly something we want to consolidate and have it as a learning resource. I personally dispute the finding. I think it is significant, um, and, and we're, we're certainly working to find a way to make it more publicly available um, as an archive. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted, whoops, sorry, asking you, Ulrich, if you could comment of, about the, the new notion of the Anthropocene and how it's being used increasingly and accepted, I think, by the scientific world increasingly, yes. uh, and how that would be a route in for human ecology uh, to be that, accepted. Yes, it, it, it is indeed. Um, it, it was... Professor Kruzen, um, Nobel Prize winner in physics, who was at a meeting somewhere in America, and, and this sort of thing was being discussed, and he suddenly stood up and said, I think we should call this era the Anthropocene as the first time ever that one species, the human species, has made a permanent, permanent, just let me say that again, permanent change uh, to the planet. So it is of geological significance, and therefore we can call it, like all the other geological ages, but we can call this um, after humans, the Anthropocene. And that has caught on and been accepted by the people who name geological epochs, I don't know who they are, um, that it is now an accepted scientific word for what we are doing. And one could say the science of the Anthropocene is human ecology. So in a way, if that really goes further, human ecology as a title will be used even less, but done even more. And, uh, but it is now the accepted term. Everybody talks about the living in the Anthropocene, we really have changed the planet. And, and forever, the extinctions we've already caused, and it's getting worse and worse by the year, um, it leads to the sixth mass extinction of the same sort as when the meteor wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, I'm sorry, um, I know there's a couple other questions, yeah, but we're now, maybe we could gather a few questions and Ulrich can have one final answer uh, and then lunch is served a little bit behind schedule. So there was, uh, was there one, two, and okay, and one, two, three. So brief, brief questions and we'll put them simultaneously to Ulrich. It's actually a bit of a reflection on what's just been said. Um, I do a lot of work. Put your microphone a little further, further away. Down. It's That's fine. Yes. I do I do a lot of work trying to um, make these issues sort of more um, present in the thinking of a wider public, and a lot of people within the wider public really struggle with the term Anthropocene. But as soon as you say human ecology, and if people have a basic understanding of ecology, and you're like, well, it's that for humans, they just get it straight away. So I just wanted to add that to the yes. comments, because it's very accessible for a lot of people to understand. I think that is worthwhile. 
because people, for other things, they all talk about dinosaurs, but they, don't, they can't name the geological era in which the dinosaurs lived, and why should they be able to name this geological era? So Anthropocene will, can remain a scientific description in the scientific world, and human ecology, indeed, can be more popular. I think that is fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, if you knew uh, that if anyone at the University of Edinburgh was actually using the archives, and is it feeding into any of the courses? So if, if fe feeding into what? Any of the courses that are being taught at the university in Edinburgh, do you know if the archive is already being <coughs> used? or? Um, I wrote to the archivist before this meeting saying we are going to have this meeting and I want to come again and it was just when the university was going on strike, as many are nowadays, a few months ago, um, post-COVID, but still with mask situations, and so uh, he put me off and I couldn't go and I haven't gone since, but I want to go back. It, it, we need to get that stuff out. And yes, does that, that, that doesn't quite answer your question. No, I, mean, I, don't know, I guess I'm just kind of asking because I, I work there uh, to teach there at the art school. You work there? I work there at the art school as part of the university. So I was just interested, partly in case anyone else in the room <laughs> yes. works there, to, to find out whether it's already feeding into... Can I answer that question? That we have been involved with the Design for Change programme at Edinburgh School of Art, where um, we, with Rachel um, yeah. Harkness, your colleague, uh, I imagine, um, there's been groups of students who visit us here um, and receive some, uh, some of the human ecology um, material, um, which was uh, very successful and we hope to repeat it. So I think that's the closest um, of use of the, the legacy in a kind of sideways way through, through Rachel's invitation for us to contribute to that programme. So a very brief, I've been told it's two words from Ed and then, uh, and then we'll have lunch. Impact and relevance, okay? Impact, when you look at that, everything you've done is a dream for, for any university, any organisation about the impact pathway. And relevance, you just have to listen to our glorious Prime Minister's comments recently about growth to know how relevant what you're saying and what we're doing is so important. So two words, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ed. I thought you were going to mention that the university is finally trying to do something like what we did all those 30 years ago um, in the, what they call the Institute of Futures. The Futures Institute, yeah. Well, we're going to go that Monday. It is just conceivable that they're picking up the tabs a bit it is absolutely the case that the public is now really aware. Look at all you people in this room. If we'd held this meeting in 1972, there would have been half a dozen here. And that's terrific. So thank you all for coming and uh, bring all your friends. Thank you so much, Ulrich, um, for, for sharing with us what's an absolutely amazing legacy. Thank you.